The first thing I heard when I came upstairs after tackling a mountain of laundry was Megan, <laughs> sobbing behind her closed bedroom door. I pictured her lying on her bed, clutching her stomach, or maybe her head. We had reached the point where everything seemed to hurt, all the time. I wasn't sure what was more distressing, her tears or that I didn't know how to help her anymore. Nobody did, though it wasn't for lack of trying. Even Jake and Robbie, who were 12, were as well-versed about pain relievers as they were about video games and the leading scorers in the NHL, CFL, and NBA. I pushed open the door to Dan's office. His back was to me, his eyes glued to a document on his computer screen. Dan, I said. He turned, startled as if he'd forgotten he shares a house with other people. What's up, honey? A pleased-to-see-you smile began spreading across his face. I almost smiled back, until the sobs reminded me of my mission. Did you hear that? Hear what? He asked. Your daughter, crying? He looked at me helplessly. Megan, she cries all the time. She doesn't cry all the time, I said. Maybe four nights out of seven, sometimes five. This week, seven. So maybe Dan was right, but I couldn't bring myself to agree with him. If I could do something about it, I would. He said his voice tired and sad. I wanted to argue with him to say, none of us can do anything about it, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. But what good would that do? I left the office and crossed the hall, trying to compose myself. I could hear snuffles from Megan's room, but nothing from Jake and Robbie's. No doubt they were glued to some video game, earbuds on to keep the pings and whistles from disturbing the rest of us. They were such good kids. Sometimes I felt guilty that a lot of my attention seemed to go to their sister. I knocked lightly on Megan's door, then pushed it open before she could respond. Her back was to me. She was curled into a ball, hugging her long, slender legs to her chest. Her hair fanned out around her pillow and dropped off the edge of her bed. How awful was it that I wish she were crying about a boy? That's what 15-year-old girls were supposed to cry about. Heartbreak and fights with their BFFs. Megan didn't get to see her BFF enough to fight with her. I wasn't even sure Maisie qualified as a BFF anymore because they hardly ever got together. They saw each other on the rare days Megan was able to get to school, and I was pretty sure they kept up a texting relationship. Megan was so often in pain she rarely had the energy to do the fun things teenage girls were supposed to with friends. No shopping, no movies, no sports teams. Back when Megan was in early elementary school, she dreamed of becoming an Olympic figure skater, but she hadn't taken lessons since sixth grade when the headaches began. And forget about boys. They hate me, Mom, she would cry to me. They think I'm making it up, that I'm pretending I'm sick. I'm not pretending. It hurts. Everything hurts. On more than one occasion, she'd beg to be homeschooled. For the most part, she was, because her pain issues meant she spent more days at home than at school. <laughs> What is it? I asked, kneeling on the floor and stroking her hair. I no longer made the mistake of sitting on her bed to calm her. Even the pressure of someone else on the mattress could set her off. My stomach, she moaned. Mom, please do something. What? I wanted to ask. We've done everything. We'd been to the pediatrician, the family doctor, the pediatric gastroenterologist, the pediatric neurologist, the pediatric emergency room, and the walk-in clinic. No one had an answer. Some physicians treated Megan as if she were imagining her pain, and others acted like I was the worst kind of helicopter parent. How about hot compresses, I said, trying to sound optimistic. Though the days when a hot compress could make her feel better were in the distant past. Before Megan could answer, Dan walked into the room. I think I found a place for help, he said, his voice unusually hopeful. Did you know that there's a pain clinic at the hospital for kids? Here, I said. In the city? He nodded. I wasn't sure what surprised me more. That there was a place in our city that could help Megan? Or that Dan was the one who had to find out online that it existed? How did you find out about it? And why hasn't anyone told us about it? I googled. Kids, pain, help. I don't know why we haven't heard about it, but it looks as if all you need is a doctor's referral to get in. I'm sure Dr. Morale can do that. He said looking at Megan, who was listening intently. He rested his hand lightly on her shoulder. It's going to be okay, honey. 
We're going to get you some help. Dan was right. Dr. Morali had no problem referring Megan to the pediatric chronic pain clinic. She was happy to do so. I'm glad I found a clinic that can help. I was anxious about our first appointment. Part of me was hopeful that Megan would finally get the help she needed, but I didn't want to raise my expectations. Or hers. What if this turned out to be another dead end? Another case of, we can't find anything wrong with her, so clearly there is nothing wrong with her. Or worse, these are just normal growing pains, and you, Mom, need to stop coddling her. I couldn't face that one more time, and I knew that Megan couldn't either. Far from being the clinic of my nightmares, the pediatric chronic pain clinic turned out to be exactly what we needed. That's not hype. It's not an overstatement. It is the truth. I felt like we were finally in the right place. And so did Megan. Tell us about your pain, Megan, said Dr. Song, the physician, after he introduced us to the rest of the healthcare team at the chronic pain clinic. I could tell Megan liked the idea of having a team to help care for her. Bonnie, the nurse practitioner, Penny, the physiotherapist, and Dr. Carvalho, the psychologist. I liked it, too. Megan explained how the pain had started with stomach aches when she was in grade six, how we tried changing her diet. More fiber, less fiber, no gluten, no dairy. But no matter what she did or didn't eat, the pains continued. She told the team about her headaches, how she had them daily, usually first thing in the morning and at bedtime. Tears filled her eyes when she talked about how she'd had to quit figure skating and hadn't been able to join a single club in junior high or high school, how she rarely saw her friends anymore and felt left out. Then, in a sobbing voice that made me choke back my own tears, she asked her first questions of the session. Do you believe me? And can you make the pain go away? Dr. Song was the picture of kindness. The answers are yes and no, he said. Your pain is real. Just because we can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Everyone in this room knows that you're not making it up. But you can't make it go away, Megan asked, her voice a squeak. Dan and I each took one of her hands and held it. She squeezed my hand extra hard and I squeezed back, trying to send her the reassurance that Dr. Song was reluctant to offer. Dr. Song took over. Chronic pain is a disease, he explained gently. Your pain is real. Our job is to help you manage it. We want you to have a better life than you have since the pain started. We want to help you meet your goals, such as skating. The appointment lasted nearly two hours, but the time flew by. Megan, Dan, and I learned more about the central nervous system than I had thought possible to absorb in an afternoon. We also learned about how pain exists in our nerves and in our cells and that the same pain medications that work for acute pain, like broken bones, often don't work well for chronic pain. Even taking ibuprofen every day wouldn't help Megan's headaches, Dr. Song said. It's okay to take it on occasion, but by the time your headache pain becomes chronic, it's more about irritated, or you can even call them grumpy nerves than it is about anything else. Who knew that too little or too much physical activity, sleep problems, stress, anxiety, and sadness can all affect the pain signals going to the brain. Well, the team knew, and now we did. Better yet, we had strategies. To reduce the pain signals, the team recommended relaxation, gentle exercise, and plenty of hydration. They suggested distraction in the form of listening to music or doing mindful breathing exercises. They gave Megan tips for changing her sleep habits, such as fewer naps and turning off her electronic devices before bedtime. Equally important, they would help her change the way she thinks about life and her pain. It was, they said, all part of helping her. If I could make your pain go away tomorrow, Bonnie began, but Megan wouldn't let her finish. You can't though, right? She said. Bonnie nodded. That's right, Megan, I can't. But if I could, what activity would you go back to? I'd skate again, Megan said, closing her eyes. I pictured her imagining herself flying around the rink at the club where she used to take lessons nearly every day after school. The image made me smile. You can, Bonnie said. Megan's eyes popped open. The look on her face was a mixture of surprise and delight with the tiniest twinge of fear. But how? She asked. This time it was Penny who answered. You have to start slowly, she explained. You need to build up your strength. 
Listen to the voice that says, if I do this any faster or for a minute more, I'm going to pay the price tomorrow. When you hear that voice, you have to stop. This isn't a no pain, no gain kind of thing. It's more of a no pain, no gain deal. I can really skate again? Megan asked. I swear I could hear her heart beating with excitement. You certainly can, Dr. Song said. And it's good for you. Regular, gentle exercise can help you feel better, if you do it right. Know my pains? Megan said. I definitely know them. (laughs) She rolled her eyes, an expression that makes most parents of a teenager cringe. Seeing her make light of a condition that had defeated her for so long had the opposite effect on me. I smiled along with everyone else in the room. You will have gains too, trust me, Penny assured her. Once you've started a routine, if you want, you can come back to the clinic and we can talk about it. Any problems you're having, what's working. If you're interested, I can put together an exercise program for you. I like that, Megan said, and this time the look on her face was one of pure happiness. The pediatric chronic pain clinic was the best thing that had happened to our family since Megan's pain started. As part of the program, she was signed up for pain class. Pain class was a weekly program for kids. There were eight in Megan's class, six girls and two boys. They were around the same age and had similar stories. Unexplained and hard to manage pain, difficulty going to school, little social life, few, if any, friends. Once a week, they met in a classroom at the hospital to talk about their issues with Dr. Carvalho and Bonnie and learn more coping strategies. It was a cognitive behavioral therapy and teen support group. The students earned high school class credits for attending the group sessions. Pain class also had a parent session. Dan wisecracked that we were joining the pain PTA, but the program was no joke. None of the parents had met before, but because we'd had so many of the same experiences, we felt as if we'd known each other forever. I left each parent session feeling as if I'd made a dozen new friends and learned how to help Megan manage her pain. I even learned how to take care of myself so I could better support her. As Megan learned new strategies to manage her pain, we've noticed definite improvements. She's able to be more active, misses fewer classes, and is on track to graduate from high school. She's been hanging out with her friends, spending more time with them and less time crying in her room. At least once a week, she and Maisie go skating. That's freed me to spend more time with Jake and Robbie. Last weekend, I allowed them to drag me to laser tag. I lost. Badly. I often think of that first day when we met the team at the chronic pain clinic, when Megan tried to find humor in the idea of knowing her pain. Looking back, I see that having a team of experts to support her offered her a kind of freedom that she and her dad and I had not imagined possible. No pain, no gain has become our family motto. As the whole team warned, Megan still has pain. Some days are worse than others, but those worst days are fewer and more far between. We're all better at managing the pain. Between our team, the pain PTA, and Megan's class, we have developed skills to cope and have a plan. Chronic pain never goes away. That's why it's called chronic, after all. But one of the most important lessons we've learned is that with the right tools and strategies, Megan can control the pain instead of the pain controlling Megan. And that's the biggest gain of all.